I think that everyone knows this equation. And uh, do you know who is the person that Einstein, you would say, well, uh, you can move on. Um, the first man who uh, published this equa equation was Oliver Hefside in his electromagnetic theory. Then Henry Poincaré and Olinto de Preto, who also registered this equation. He was a um, very good friend of the father of Einstein, but the, this equation had a problem because energy is not only related to mass, but also to the movement of objects. Because when you have an object that moves, you put a force and acceleration. So what Einstein did, he completed the equation uh, in his spatial relativity, adding the momentum, which is the movement of the objects. In the momentum, we have time, and the equation becomes a uh, uh, double order equation. So when you want to know what is the value of energy, you need to use a square root. And as everyone knows, when you use a square root, you have two results, a positive result and a negative result. For example, the square root of nine is plus three and minus three. So we have plus energy and minus energy. Plus energy has positive time, minus energy has negative time. So this fundamental equation says that there are two type of energy, one that diverges forward in time, and the other one that diverges backward in time. Well, um, in the 1920s, all the physicists said, oh, the second solution of the energy that diverges backward in time is just impossible, because the future does not exist. Antonella? But uh, in the 1940s, a mathematician from he was born in, uh, in Viterbo, which is not far away from here. Uh, and he was one of the foremost mathematicians of the last century. In the 1950s, he was invited by Oppenheimer to go and work at the Institute of Advanced Study and work directly with Einstein. Well, he said, I'm a mathematician. I'm not a physicist. I want to see what these two solutions mean. Uh, he could not accept that physicists had rejected, in a subjective way, um, half of the fundamental solutions of the equations. So, uh, looking at the two equations, the positive time energy diverges, and it is governed by the law of entropy. Entropy uh, is when you have energy and it disperses out. and um, the backward in time solution of energy instead is energy that uh, contracts. So in the first case, we have a cause and the energy diverges. In the, other, uh, in the second uh, situation, we have energy that uh, converges towards an attractor. And uh, if we look at the properties of the second solution, we have energy concentration, increase of differentiation, uh, uh, increase of complexity, structure, order, which are exactly the mysterious properties of life. So what Fantapie did, he wrote a small booklet titled The Unitary Theory of the Physical and Biological world, world, where he shows that the physical world, which is also the visible world, uh, is governed by the positive time energy solution. Whereas, uh, there is another uh, world, but they are combined together, they're not divided, uh, which is invisible because it's caused by the future, and we cannot see the future. And this is fundamental for life, the second uh, type of energy. Uh, you can move forward. Uh, it is important to say that these two types of energies are complementary since the equation says that energy is one, but it can have two different forms, the entropic one, which is the diverging energy, and the syntropic one, which is the converging energy. And uh, so we can say energy is one, and it is the sum of entropy and syntropy. 
And entropy is not the opposite of syntropy, but it's the complement. Uh, and that means that they are always playing together, entropy and uh, syntropy, a bit like Shiva and Shakti. They are totally different, but they are united uh, together. Uh, you can move forward. Now, uh, for this reason, since entropy and syn syntropy are complementary, uh, we can represent them uh, using a seesaw. Uh, on one side, entropy, and the, on the other side, syntropy, and life in between. Life receives syntropy, which is life energy, but it is playing in the physical reality. And the purpose of life is to always reduce entropy and try to increase syntropy, because syntropy is the life energy, we want life energy, but whatever we do produces entropy. So we have this kind of game about trying to reduce entropy, but whatever we do increases entropy. And when we are able to reduce entropy, the syntropic part uh, increases. So this is the invisible part, but this uh, representation tells that we can work on the invisible side of reality, reducing the entropic side of our physical reality. And in any choice we do, we can decide if we want to do it in a very entropic way or in a less entropic way. Uh, for example, I'm a vegetarian since 1972, and one of the reasons is that that reduces entropy, because you need less energy, less uh, resources to produce the same amount of nourishment. Now, you can go forward. Um, so the game of life, according to this model, is that uh, life seeks to, uh, to reduce entropy and to increase syntropy. But entropy is produced by our activities. How can we stay active and increase syntropy? This is the challenge. Uh, and, and this is uh, the game of life. Okay, we can move forward. Now, Antonella, what she did, because the problem with Fantapie was that he wrote this little booklet. He, um, he was one of the foremost mathematicians, the mathematics behind syntropy, very strong, but he could not provide experimental proof to his theory, because when you do an experiment, you manipulate causes and you see the effects. And it is difficult to see the effects manipulating future causes, because we're not in the future. Well, I, Antonella, she did three different dissertations on this topic of syntropy. And in her, her PhD in cognitive psychology, the hypothesis she was working on is, if life is sustained by syntropy, the parameters of the autonomic nervous system that support vital functions should react in advance to stimuli because syntropy and syntropic energy flows backward in time. So uh, the idea was if we uh, monitor the heart rate and the skin conductance, we should see that re they react before uh, stimuli. And in the scientific literature, there were all already experiment, experiments that showed that when you have emotional stimuli, there is an um, advanced reaction of the heart rate and skin, skin conductance, like if we have a presentiment of what is going to happen. And uh, the last experiments she did were with colors. Uh, the person was exposed to different colors, like a full screen computer color, and he had to try to guess which color the computer would have randomly chosen. Well, what we see is that in the heart rate, there is a strong variation, difference, according to the color that will be shown. But uh, when the person chooses, he's not able to guess. So there is a kind of distinction between the head and the heart. In a way, the heart, or the autonomic nervous system, already knows the future, but the head has difficulties to assess this type of information. Um, okay. Now, uh, 
following these results of these experiments, uh, the heart uh, has a very central, uh, important uh, role because it can tell us where to go, uh, where the attractor is. Uh, um, since syntropy is a converging energy, when we are moving towards the attractor, because a syntropy comes from a future attractor and we are converging towards that attractor, well, when we are converging towards the attractor, we feel uh, warmth and well-being in this area of the body, and th that tells us that we're going in the right direction. If we diverge from the attractor, then we have void and we feel uh, pain and suffer in this area of the body. So this works exactly as a compass that uh, tells us if we're diverging from the aim, from the tractor, or we're converging towards it. it. And according to this model, we have to pay a lot of attention to this signal because it tells us which is the most beneficial direction for ourselves and also for the others. Okay. Uh, following this model, we have three levels of consciousness. The um, brain is always receiving information from the past and from the future. Our physical senses give information that comes from the past. But we, ha we feel emotions and we have all constantly to choose if we want to follow the head or follow the heart. So if we stick to the past or to the future. Then we have the uh, autonomic um, level, which is unconscious and uh, keeps and stores a lot of information, which are, is vital information and cannot be handled by the brain. And there is another level which is linked to the uh, attractor that we name the su superconscious level of the mind, which is linked to intuitions, to visions. It could be linked to precognition. And it is what uh, Teilhard de Chardin named the omega point. Everyone, according to Teilhard de Chardin, he was a biologist, but also a Jesuit. And uh, working on, uh, uh, in paleontology, he could see that uh, uh, um, what Darwin was expecting about transitional species was just missing in paleontology. But he could see that species were, in a way, evolving uh, towards attractors. So he introduced the concept of the omega point, which is an attractor in the future, towards which uh, all the individual and species are uh, evolving towards. So in his opinion, uh, God didn't create life from the past, but he created from the future. And what we are doing is trying to converge back to it. And he named that Omega Point. Uh, so, uh, just to be very simple in a way, we live in a super causal world with causes acting from the past, and we have causality and causes acting from the future, and these are attractors. And they work in a retrocausal way. Well, causality and retrocausality uh, work in a totally different way, because since causality is diverging, if we want to have a big effect, we need a very big cause. Instead, since retrocausality is converging, uh, when we have a cause here, it amplifies it. So the smallest is the cause, the biggest is the effect that we obtain use, using retrocausality. And for example, we can see that in homeopathy. Uh, in homeopathy, the smallest is the active substance. Uh, the most di diluted it is, the stronger is the effect. Uh, the problem with this model is that um, syntropy and entropy uh, cause a kind of conflict inside ourselves because the 
a conscious level is converging, and that means that our uh, feeling of life, ourself, is very small and punctual. Whereas entropy, the material reality, is diverging. We live in a universe that is diverging. And so our universe, our physical reality, tends to be infinite. When we compare ourselves to the universe, which is infinite, we realize to be nil, to be equal to zero. So we have always a conflict between the fact that we feel that we exist, but we realize that we're equal to nothing. So to be or not to be. And, <laughs> and if we are not, if we're equal to zero, there is no purpose, there is no aim, life, life has no meaning, and so uh, what are we doing here? And that is one of the key, it's one of the key problems of uh, humanity, of all the people. What people try to do is say, well, I, I feel to be equal to nothing. Well, maybe I could increase the numerator of the equation. So I, I try to get a lot of judgment from the other people or become rich, wealthy, popular, have a lot of power or get meaning in other ways. But what, whatever I do at the numerator, compared to the infinite of the universe, I'm still equal to zero. So, <laughs> no, but that happens, you know, one gets money, but he, he has a momentary relief from feeling e equal to nothing. And so he wants more money, more money, and it's never enough because you will always be equal to zero using the, uh, following this path. The other strategy that is used is to try to reduce the universe. So you say, uh, my universe is a, a small group, like my office or my com community, my religious uh, group or whatever. Uh, and so when you're totally accepted by this community, you feel to have a meaning because you take away the same community from up and down and you, you feel you have a meaning, but you become totally dependent from this community. So you want to be totally accepted from it. And so there is a kind of craving from, uh, and a fear to be rejected. Now the other strategy which is used is to say, well, no universe, no community, it's just me. And you try to uh, solve the identity conflict in this way. And this is at the basis of, say, most of the psychiatric disorders. Because you have an outside world, uh, because you become your outside world, but you feel to be meaningless, useless, and so the outside world is to continuously telling you that you're meaningless. And for, uh, for example, in schizophrenia, people con uh, continuously have these voices, hallucinations, that tell them that they are equal to zero. And uh, so these are the three main strategies that we use, and they are not effective. What uh, the syntropy model says is that we should unite ourselves to the universe, and only in this case, I become equal to I. But this means that the universe is entropy, the diverging part, whereas I is syntropy, the converging part. Only when we're able to combine together and unite these two uh, appar apparently opposite sides of reality, we uh, discover the meaning of our life. And this is moving from duality, because duality is entropy and syntropy, uh, constantly uh, playing one against the other. It's moving from duality to non-duality, because we have the union of the, these two opposite sides. And at the same time, this can be done only through unity, which is love. So in a way, love is uh, say, the tool, what provides a meaning to life. And this is named the theorem, theorem of life, love. 
Um, okay, I'll stop here uh, because I, I like a lot your questions. And uh, we have a website which is syntropia.it and with several books in it that we, uh, you can uh, get from Amazon. There are paperback books and Kindle books. Um, we have taken here with us uh, two, two books, if you want, Antonella has some, and uh, uh, okay. Now, I, I would like very much your questions, if you have. <laughs> 